everyone. Uh, yep, I am here to talk about questions. And uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about beautiful questions. And in a minute, I'll describe what I mean by that. First, I think I'd like to just give you an example of a beautiful question that, at first glance, it might not seem like a beautiful question. This was a question that was asked by a coach at uh, the University of Florida a number of years ago. And uh, one day, out of the blue, he wondered this. <laughs> it may seem like an odd question, maybe even a little freaky, but um, there were good reasons for it. He, was, um, he had noticed that the players were uh, drinking a lot of water on the sidelines, but when the game was over, um, they weren't relieving themselves, shall we say. And uh, so he was sort of puzzled by this, and he did something that every good questioner should do, which is that he shared his question with others. In particular, he shared it with a professor at the university there, at the University of Florida, and it was a professor who happened to specialize in um, kidney medicine. So he described the situation and uh, his question, and the, the professor said, oh, I, you know, I, I know what that's all about. They're drinking water on the sidelines, but they're sweating so much that they can't replace the fluids, uh, the electrolytes. So the coach said, okay. And that might have been the end of it, but at that point, the professor got very interested in this question and kind of invested in it. And he kind of took it to the next level. He took it from a why question to a what if question. Uh, and he asked, what if we could somehow come up with a mixture or a drink that would be wetter than water, that would essentially replace these, these fluids better than, better than water could? So he goes down into the university lab and he starts mixing in his beakers. He comes up with a, with a, a liquid, a drink, and he takes it to the coach. And the coach says, I'm not gonna touch that stuff. Um, but we could try it on the players. <laughs> and uh, however, he's a, he's a shrewd coach, so he doesn't try it on his starters. He tries it on his practice squad. <laughs> and uh, later that day, the practice squad has a scrimmage against the starters. And sure enough, the practice squad wins. And you can imagine the, the scene of jubilation as the, uh, you know, these downtrodden uh, practice squad players are uh, high-fiving and celebrating while also running off the field to go to the bathroom. The thing that came out of this, as you may have guessed by now, is Gatorade. And the thing that makes this a really beautiful question is that there is now a $20 billion sports drink industry that originated with that question. And it's funny how, you know, I've been, I've been working on question, this question book for a couple of years now, and there are stories like this all over the place. It's very interesting how so many um, innovations and breakthroughs, if you trace them back to the origins, uh, there's a question back there, and oftentimes a really interesting question. So I started talking about beautiful questions. I define it this way. It's a question that challenges assumptions, inquires about things normally taken for granted, and it wonders about new possibilities. Okay, so when you ask that kind of a question, good things happen. So what types of people ask beautiful questions? First and foremost, designers. Designers are great at asking beautiful questions. In fact, this is how I got started on this whole thing. Um, I was writing a book a couple of years ago about designers and um, a book called Glimmer. I wrote a book in which I, I, I followed designers around. I talked to a lot of designers and I sort of looked at how they worked. And I noticed that a lot of them started with questioning. That was sort of the, when they would first tackle a problem and they had to frame the problem and figure out what was really the key issue here, it usually was a matter of uh, coming up with the question that had to be answered. So, so questioning is a really huge thing with designers. And it, it, it goes beyond the framing stage into other stages of design. I mean, even when you get to uh, when designers are uh, prototyping, um, that is really a, a questioning stage. There's a guy at IDEO, uh, Diego Rodriguez, who said uh, a, a prototype is a question embodied. Because every time you create a prototype, you're really just questioning, how will this work? And what will happen if we try this? So uh, designers kind of question all the way through the process. Um, uh, who else uh, is asks beautiful questions? Um, guys like these, really creative CEOs. And I want to make a distinction between really creative CEOs and regular CEOs. Harvard Business Review uh, published a study a couple of years ago that was um, looking at the most creative executives in the business world and found that guys like Bezos and uh, Steve Jobs 
were really active and uh, imaginative questioners. They questioned everything. I mean, they drove their employees crazy. They questioned so much. But then when you went down to the next level of, of CEOs, those guys didn't question at all because they were of the mindset that, you know, if you're a, if you're a CEO, you're the boss and you're the authority figure and you're the expert. And so you're being paid the big bucks to have all the answers. You're not supposed to have questions. So it's very interesting that the guys who kind of succeed are the ones who don't buy into that garbage and who are, understand that you have to question all the time because it's the only way you're going to lead your company into new directions and new areas. And who else questions? I, artists, we, we know that artists question. I mean, that's sort of a well-known thing. Artists kind of live with questions, right? That's their, that's their constant struggle. Um, I took the title of, my, of the book I'm doing from the poet E.E. E. Cummings, who had this line, always the beautiful answer who asks a more beautiful question. So I'm using the, the end of that, a more beautiful question, as the title for my book. But I think also, you know, uh, we're looking at big time questioners, scientists, of course. Their work is rooted in questioning. And there's one scientist in particular who um, was a huge advocate and champion of questioning. And I was really glad when I realized, when I discovered that he was into questioning because I felt it kind of validated um, this project I was working on and it's always good to have this guy in your corner. <laughs> he, he says, Einstein has said a number of things about questioning, but one of the things he said that I, that I like uh, best, he said, if I had, if I had um, an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would spend the first 55 minutes making sure I was solving the right problem and answering the right question. What Einstein understood is that if you, if you sort of start with the wrong question, you're just going to go down the wrong path. And uh, it's, it's not going to do anybody any good. Um, so, you know, scientists, obviously big questioners. Um, also, big questioners are people who attend the CUSP conference. I mean, you being here indicates that you are probably a questioner by nature. I mean, you're probably someone who's very curious, very engaged. Even the fact that you go to this type of a conference as opposed to you know, a conference on uh, a certain type of accounting software, you know, you're going to a conference that is very horizontal and, and is very uh, expansive and is connecting different ideas. And that's what questioners tend to do. So I have no doubt that most of the people here are, um, you know, are questioners on some level. So, you know, you could say, well, should I stop my presentation right here? Um, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> I have 16 minutes to go, so I'm gonna say, the thing is, even if you're a really good questioner, there's so much we all have to learn about questioning, and there's so many ways you can get better at it. Um, it's, it's a funny thing, because we, we think of questioning, and I, I, when I was writing the book, I sort of grappled with this issue. Uh, people think of questioning as just like, like breathing or something. It's like so natural, uh, it's so easy, that they kind of think there's nothing to it. There's not really um, a skill to it or, or, a, or an art to it. And, you know, I spent time with a lot of questioning experts. There's a group called the Right Question Institute that really studies, like, how we think when we're asking questions. And um, they, there was an interesting line from someone at the Right, Question, right Questioning Institute who said, questioning is the ability to organize our thinking around what we don't know. Think about trying to tackle something where you don't know. And now you have to figure out how you're going to tackle this problem. And there's so much information you don't know. And that's what questioning does. Questioning is, is uh, uh, your, our way of trying to grapple with the unknown. So it's a really high level form of thinking, something that I think is pretty helpful uh, in developing sort of a system of inquiry, uh, a way to think about questioning. Uh, and it's based on a lot of observation of how master questioners question. And um, I'm referring to it as the holy trinity of questioning. And I'll get back to that and uh, tell you in a minute about why I think that's an important thing. But first I want to talk uh, just for a second about why the world doesn't really welcome your questions, which is kind of a shame. This is kind of the sign that the world puts up there. You know, if you trace this back and you, you go all the way back to childhood, this is kind of where it starts. I mean, we all know that kids ask, uh, sort of come out of the womb questioning. I mean, it's a natural instinct. I've discovered in my research that kids ask 40,000 questions between ages two and five. That's my niece, Bridget, there. And I did actually count the number of questions she asked between years two and five. <laughs> and um, no, I didn't. But, but I, I have a feeling she would have gone beyond 40,000. 
it's such a natural thing for, for kids, right? It's something they start out doing. Another interesting statistic I came across, this is from the UK, which said that four-year-old girls in the UK have 390 questions a day for their mum. It also said the reason their mum gets so many questions is when they ask the father, he says, go ask your mum. <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of interesting too, because that attitude of, you know, go ask, go ask your mum, right? It's a kind of a common attitude that adults sometimes have about kids questioning a lot. Like we say we want kids to question, we say we want our kids to question a lot, but the reality of it can sometimes wear people down and, and it, it can get a little frustrated. This has been observed by one of the great modern philosophers, and I'm talking, of course, about Louis C.K. Um, he talked about the fact that they never stop. Why bother to answer them? They're just going to ask you again. There's no point in it. Louis C.K. had a great bit, which some of you may have heard, but I'm just going to quote a tiny bit from it about, you know, his daughter asking him why. And it starts with, you know, why can't we go outside? Well, because it's raining. Why? Well, water's coming out of the sky. Why? Because it was in a cloud. Why? Well, clouds form when there's vapor. Why? I don't know. I don't know any more things. Those are all the things I know. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I'm stupid, okay? I'm stupid. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I didn't pay attention in school. <laughs> Why? Because I was high all the time, I smoked too much pot. <laughs> and this goes on and on and devolves until uh, finally, to the point where he's answering his four-year-old daughter, because we're alone in the universe and no one gives a shit about us. <laughs> so, so that, you know, that, it's a funny bit, but there's a lot of truth, as is often the case with great comedians, there's a lot of truth embedded in that humor. And, and the truth there is that we really do that kind of questioning coming from kids really exposes us. It reminds us of how little we know and uh, about all the things we probably should be curious about, but we're not. And uh, so it's very interesting. Parents have mixed feelings about this kind of questioning, and believe me, kids pick up on that. But that's not the real, uh, that's not the real issue. The trouble really starts when kids go to school. There is a phenomenon that happens when kids go to school that involves dropping off a cliff. They start school questioning at a rate of hundreds of questions a day. By the time they're in elementary school, that's probably down to about half that amount. And by the time they're in high school, that's right down near zero. It's a very sort of scary and uh, alarming phenomenon. And you may say, well, you know, hey, I've, I've seen classrooms and kids have their hands up, but they're not asking questions, they're answering. They're answering the teacher's question, which means they're like, sort of like trained seals, right? <laughs> they, are, they have been given little bits of information to memorize and to spit back when called upon. And um, that's, you know, you could say that's a fine system of education. It, it works on some levels. It was really designed in the industrial age, and it, that system of teaching and ed educating is really good for um, producing obedient factory workers. Uh, it's less effective in an age where we're trying to produce creative, uh, innovative thinkers who are able to come up with their own ideas and their own questions. It, it's an issue, and, and this doesn't get any better when school is over and we move to the workplace, because, uh, you know, in the workplace, if I ask questions at work, am I asking for trouble? You could be seen as insubordinate. Well, why don't you know that in the first place? Why are you asking me? You know, you could be seen as challenging your boss. You could, all kinds of negative things tend to go with that. So, one of the things I'm talking about in my, in my research and in my discussions with people is, is this big question of how do we foster a culture of inquiry? And not only in the workplace, in companies like Google, which are doing a pretty good job of it, but um, in schools and really everywhere. You know, how do we encourage uh, questioning? And this is really, it's more important than ever now because, you know, we had a great presentation about the exponential rate of change yesterday. I don't, I don't know if some of you saw it. It was just sort of mind-boggling how fast things are changing. And when things are changing that fast, questioning becomes even more important. Because what happens when you're in a situation of dynamic, exponential change, answers become obsolete, like overnight. And you have to have the tools to get the new information and get the new ways of doing things and the new ideas. And questioning is a big tool. So we're sort of in a time right now where answers are going down in value, questions are going up. On an individual level, 
how do we rekindle that inquiry flame, that passion for questioning we had when we were younger? It's an interesting question. I, I've been looking at this holy trinity idea um, because when I study questioners in the design world or in the innovation world, in the business world, I find so often they cycle through this process of why, what, if, how. They look at a problem and they kind of analyze it and try to figure out why does the problem exist in the first place, okay? And then from, at some point they move to, well, what can we do about that? And then at some point they move to, you know, how. And each of these involves a different skill set. The why questioning to me is curiosity, detachment, and non-acceptance. And curiosity is obvious, but what I mean by detachment is when you're asking why to do it effectively, you have to be able to step back. And that you have to be able to step back from assumptions. You have to step back from sort of the everyday way of doing things. You have to get a new perspective on things. And that's really big for questioners. Another big thing about asking why is the non-acceptance. Because you have to be willing to say, you have to be willing to challenge things. If you're going to ask why questions, you have to be willing to challenge. People are going to tell you, this is the way it's been done here for 20 years. And you have to be willing to say, why? Why has it been done that way for 20 years? Can you show me a good reason? So I think that you have to have those qualities. I think of this as, you know, releasing your inner George Carlin because you have to be that skeptic and that person who is kind of looking at everything and just saying, what the hell are these people doing? Kids are, again, very good at this. You know, kids are really good at asking those why questions. There's a great story about um, Edwin Land, um, the, uh, the great inventor, and he goes on vacation with his three-year-old daughter. And he takes, this is in the 1940s, he takes a picture of her with a standard camera and she says, okay, let me see it. And uh, he says, no, 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 honey, we have to send it out and it goes to a special place, a lab, and they develop it and then they'll come back in a few days and then you'll see the picture. And she says, why do we have to wait for the picture? And that question stayed with Edwin Land and sort of haunted him for a while. And then he started to act on it and do something and he eventually created the Polaroid instant camera. But he didn't do it just by asking why, he did it by also asking what if and how. So he moved to the second and third stages of this trilogy I'm talking about. What if is about envisioning what might be. Okay, why is kind of about what, what's out there, what's going on, what's the problem? What if is the next step, what might be? What might we do? And in the case of Edwin Land, his what if question was, what if you could have a dark room inside a camera? Pretty radical notion. That, that's the thing about what if questions though. They can be really big and ambitious and really bold and uh, almost asking impossible things. You should do that when you're at the what if stage. You should ask really ambitious questions. But you do have to get to the how stage, which is how are you going to deliver on this big, bold, ambitious idea? You know, Edwin Land, it took him years to figure out how to effectively get a dark room in, inside a camera so that he could process film inside a camera. The how stage of questioning is ingenuity, guts, perseverance. You're going to fail a lot. How is hard. That's the hard part of questioning. The other stuff is kind of fun, you know, imagining, stepping back, observing. How is hard. You've got to make it work. And uh, oftentimes the, at the how stage of, of inquiry, uh, I have found that innovators and designers try to break it down into smaller questions, you know. How might I take one small step? It's going to be really hard to take a dark room and shrink it down and get into a camera. What's the first thing I can do? How can I just do something to get started on this? So I think this why, what, if, how uh, approach works uh, on almost anything. I, I found it worked in the, in the social realm. I was interviewing um, Gary White and Matt Damon are working on you know, water.org, which is about trying to figure out how to solve water problems around the world. And they cycled through why, what, if, how all the time. It's like, why isn't the water getting there? Why have previous approaches failed? And then what if we try this sort of radical delivery system that's a little different or take coming at it a different way, but then how are we going to do that? How are we going to make that work on a practical level? So you see it everywhere, and I think you can s it applies in one's own life. I think we can all ask these sort of uh, why, what, if, how questions. I think that we can all look at our lives or our work or whatever and ask, you know, why am I doing X? Why am I taking this approach? What if I did Y instead? And how might I begin to make that happen? When you go through this process, that third part, how might I begin to make this, this happen, that may give you your beautiful question. That may give you the, the question that you can work on for a while 
and really uh, dig your teeth into. And my beautiful question is, how might I get more people interested in the power of questioning? It's just, it started with why, you know, I was interested in questioning, why is there not more information about this? Why isn't there not, why isn't there a book on it? Why isn't, and then I moved into my what if, you know, what if I create this or what if I do, what, I started with a website, what if I do a website? Well, what if I do a book? And then I got into the how of how do I do this book? And that, that would believe me, was very hard. So I, I would like to just suggest that if you uh, maybe challenge you, that over the next few days or week, think about applying some why, what, if, and how questions to something in your life or to a, a social issue that you're interested in or something, something that you're passionate about, and see if you can come up with a kind of a how might I or how might we. It can be a bigger question that involves society or involves collaborative groups. And when you do that, um, I have an idea for what you can do with that question. Um, that would help, might help you and might be useful to me because I know some of you are probably sitting there asking how might I be of help to Warren Berger in some small way. <laughs> and if you send me that question that you've come up with to amorebeautifulquestion.com, I will add it to the roster of beautiful questions that I am collecting and publish it and talk about your process if you want to talk about that. And, um, you know, I collect beautiful questions the way Davy Rothbart collects scraps of paper off of lawns. So I just want them, I, I get as, want to get as many as I can, I'm very interested in them. As a bonus, if you do this, I will send you a free ebook called Stop, Think, Create, that I did about a year ago, and it has tips from some of the top creative people in the business. There's no time for questions, which I find very ironic. <laughs> um, but I will say that you can stay in touch with me, and I hope you will. You can follow me on Twitter, engage with amorebeautifulquestion.com, and if you have ideas about questioning, if you have thoughts about questioning, share them. And uh, thank you for listening, and uh, to paraphrase the Dos Equis guy, uh, stay curious. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>